As, we, as you can see, there's a lot to get through, so I thought we'd make a, an earlier start um, just so we can get through it all, um, and that will give you some time to ask some questions, hopefully. Um, so, yeah, good afternoon. Um, thanks for coming along. Um, my name is Jamie McKenzie. Uh, I'm the chair of the SA chapter of the ACRS. Um, just a couple of housekeeping things. Uh, if you don't know, the toilets are back out into the main foyer and then kind of around the back that way. Um, I will let the presenters um, introduce themselves, um, just for the sake of expediency. Um, and the session is being recorded, so um, we, we try and do a webinar when we can, um, but because there's so much going on, we weren't able to do that. But it's being recorded, so that'll come out afterwards, and please pass on to friends and colleagues, or review it yourself, if you like. Um, so, for those that aren't aware, the ACRS is the Peak uh, Road Safety Membership Association in Australia and New Zealand. Um, some of the regular undertakings are hosting the annual Australasian Road Safety Conference, uh, publishing the Journal of Road Safety and a whole bunch of advocacy stuff that goes on in the background. Uh, bit of news, we have a new president in Anne Williamson, for those that know her, um, and our esteemed local member, uh, Martin, has stepped down after three years in the role. Uh, we also have a new Tasmanian chapter, um, so that's, that's great news <coughs> for those guys down there, uh, and a growing international outreach chapter. Um, if you are involved in road safety, which I hope you are if you're here, um, please do consider becoming a member or encouraging your corporation to, to join up. A uh, bit more on the conference that is coming up in Christchurch over in New Zealand. Um, so registrations are open and I would expect a program to be coming out um, hopefully in the next month or so. So get excited for that. It's going to be really good. It's also a, a hybrid conference, so you can you don't want to make the international journey, you can uh, register and, and view that online. Um, last thing I want to talk about is uh, I'm excited to announce that the um, SA chapter, the committee, has decided to offer a scholarship to attend a virtual um, attendance of that conference. So the idea here is to um, help an individual from the road safety sector who would otherwise be unable to attend the conference. Um, ideally, the scholarship will help the recipient to gather and apply new knowledge in their own workplace or communities to improve road safety outcomes. Uh, scholarship will also give the recipient an opportunity to collaborate with colleagues, to share knowledge and form lasting connections and networks in the interest of road safety in South Australia. Um, so we'll be putting up uh, more information about that soon, um, but please do consider applying for that if you're interested or passing it on to people who you might think would be interested. Okay. That's enough for me, so I'll pass on to our first speaker, uh, Jeremy Woolley. Okay, thank you, Jamie, and uh, hello to everyone. I'm glad to see a good turnout for this, and uh, I think, uh, That'll save my voice a bit, probably. Just for the sake of it. Does it need to be turned on, though? I think it should be on. Oops. Yeah, okay. Anyway, I think you can hear me, but um, firstly, I don't think I need to uh, reiterate to this audience the, the benefits of research and, and how important that is, but building the, the evidence base around road safety is essential. It is indeed a very challenging area, uh, it's a multidisciplinary area, uh, and there's a lot of complexity there. So we need to keep pushing forward with that evidence base and uh, coming up with the best possible policy practices and, and um, practitioners doing the right things to help improve the, the overall system. It is a hard grind though, and we are looking for systemic change and reform across the board, um, and that there is no other shortcut there. It's about a, a long-term objective to reduce trauma over the long term, and ultimately realise a vision of eliminating death and injury from use of the road network. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the presence of uh, Jack McLean here, who um, is a, a big uh, a force behind the, the uh, establishment of the Centre for Automotive Safety Research and formerly the Road Accident Research Unit. Uh, a lot of things were pioneered in, in the day around gaining that evidence for road safety and uh, the current incarnation of CASA uh, hopes to continue that proud tradition and uh, as uh, once said by uh, a bureaucrat in Canberra, uh, conduct research that makes a difference. Um, at the end of the day though, it's also important that we do uh, liaise with you, the practitioners. Uh, we do uh, speak to you, learn about your constraints, your problems, and uh, really if you're not 
aware of our research and utilising your research in your day-to-day -day activities, we're, we're pretty much failing somewhat. So I would encourage you to uh, approach us and if you want any discussions or you're frustrated about things or got bottlenecks in the way you're trying to improve road safety, we're always open to a conversation in that regard and that helps gives us a good grounding for the, the basis of our research work as well. So this afternoon you'll uh, see uh, many of our talented researchers showcasing the diversity of topics that uh, we, we uh, are working on, um, but we're uh, very open to having further discussions with you about what this might mean for uh, the areas you work in and how you might actually go about implementing as well. So without further ado, I'll hand back to Jamie to get the, the thing rolling. Hello, uh, I'm um, uh, Dr. Matthew Bulldock, uh, the uh, Deputy Director of CASA, and I'll be talking to you today about um, a study uh, profiling serious road crashes that I did with uh, Chris Stokes and Mario Monjardini. So what do we need, mean here by profiling crashes? Um, in this case it means comparing a, a sample of serious road crashes to a particular model of what uh, characteristics of a road transport system need to be in place for a safe system and it's a way of um, looking at where the gaps are currently in our in our transport system in terms of uh, uh, safety um, so by looking at a sample of crashes and comparing them to the model you can see where we need to um, uh, apply attention to try and um, improve safety um, and also by looking at such crashes if you find some that do match the model, um, so it looks like it has all the characteristics of the safe system in place, then you can recognise what kind of additional uh, countermeasures or, or technology or whatever needs to be in place uh, to achieve a safe system. So it's probably easier if I just get onto the model itself. Um, so this model was the Swedish Transport Administration model. Um, and a bit of work was done uh, on this by um, Helen Stigson, a Swedish researcher. And um, according to this model, um, all of these factors should be in place or should, uh, are necessary at the very least for a safe system. So um, at the very least you need drivers who are travelling at or below uh, the speed limit. Um, drivers shouldn't be impaired by alcohol or drugs. Um, everyone should be wearing seat belts. So obviously speed and seat belts, we're talking about uh, protection of the body, uh, uh, the, the tolerance of the human body to impact forces. Uh, cars with a, a five star rating. Um, so an emphasis there again on occupant protection. The cars should have electronic stability control and the road should have at least a four star rating. Um, so I should emphasize here that this model is applying only to the occupants of light vehicles. So we're only talking about cars and utility vehicles and SUVs, etc. So this does not apply for vulnerable road users. So this is just what you need uh, at a necessary minimum to be in place for uh, safety for vehicle occupants. So we did a couple of studies. Uh, one of them I'd, was done a few years ago, one somewhat more recently. Uh, so the first one we looked at fatal crashes. Um, so 105 fatal crashes involving people who died uh, in a light vehicle. Uh, and we analyzed coroner's files, which of course have a wealth of information about the crash. Uh, then we did a study looking at uh, serious injury crashes, um, 136 of them. Again, where people who were seriously injured in a light vehicle um, so they had an injury severity score of 12 or greater. So that's based on what's called the abbreviated injury scale. And it's just a, a sort of cutoff point that uh, suggests a reasonably serious kind of injuries. Um, and for this, we analyzed the medical notes associated with people going to hospital, um, the traffic accident reporting system, so the police data on the crash, and any results of alcohol and drug testing for people involved. So what did we find when we analyzed these crashes in terms of the model? Um, no, actually, before we get to that, <laughs> um, and I just should mention in terms of the star ratings of the cars, we based it on the time of the crash. So there's no point looking at a vehicle uh, that crashed in, in um, 2011 and comparing it to the star uh, five-star car now. It was about whether they were driving a five-star car at the time. Uh, and the road ratings, um, we used IRAP for this, which um, you get a star rating based on 78 attributes of the road. Um, and we looked at a 100 metre stretch of the road where the, around where the crash occurred. 
and for older crashes we um, looked at Google Earth images so you can actually go back and look at images around the time of, uh, when the crash occurred um, so that it was a fair um, assessment of the nature of the road at the time of the crash. So here are the results. Um, so for the fatal crashes, 105 crashes, there was only one vehicle in which someone died um, that matched the model, so a five-star car and with electronic stability control. Uh, among road users, about a third of them were compliant. Um, the road, only eight out of 105 had a, a, a four-star rating. So in terms of full compliance, vehicle road user and road, none of them were compliant with the model. Um, full non-compliance, so a non-compliant vehicle, non-compliant road users and non-compliant road, um, 68. So you can see certainly looking at the fatal crashes, um, there are huge gaps uh, in, in the system and lots of improvements to be made. When we looked at serious injury crashes, um, it was a little bit different. Um, vehicles still about 10% um only were compliant the little star there just refers to the fact there were four crashes or four vehicles that i couldn't get enough information on uh road users is a bit different so over half of them in the serious injury crashes were compliant so that means uh they were sober they weren't on drugs they were wearing the seat belt and they weren't exceeding the speed limit but they still ended up with a serious injury um road about 10 percent um kind of kind of similar in terms of uh the star ratings of the road there was one crash that did comply with all of the model, um, but someone still ended up with a serious injury. Uh, full non-compliance, so non-compliant in all aspects, uh, around about a third of them. So even in serious injury crashes, still a lot of uh, gaps in uh, the system leading to those levels of injuries. Uh, just looking at the road users more closely among the fatal, um, the fatal crashes, um, in terms of how they were non-compliant, it was pretty even across the board. So speed limit being uh, having an illegal uh, oh, so this is uh, compliance so obeying the speed limit having uh, a legal uh, blood alcohol concentration not being on drugs and wearing a seat belt it's all around the two-thirds mark 60 odd 70 percent um there were three people um or three crashes in which uh there was traveling in excess of the speed limit plus alcohol use plus drugs and plus not wearing a seat belt um and about a third of them as i said before were actually compliant in all respects um, when you look at serious injuries, um, I combined alcohol and drugs in this case. Um, probably uh, the most notable difference here is seatbelt use is a fair bit higher. Um, so uh, 121 out of the 136 cases, people were wearing a seatbelt, um, which, which is certainly a higher pro uh, proportion than in the fatal crashes. Um, there were four uh, crashes where um, there was no compliance at all, but as I noted before, uh, over half of them, uh, all the road users were compliant with the model in the serious injury crashes. So here's a step two analysis on fatal. So what does this mean? So what I've gone through so far is a step one analysis where you just look at what, what is uh, present in the crash. Now, did the vehicle have electronic stability control? Yes, tick. Um, so it's just a tick box um, kind of exercise. But in stage two, you actually look really closely at the nature of the crash and to determine whether the various factors involved actually directly contributed to uh, the fatal outcome. Um, so for example, you might have a car that has uh, no electronic stability control, so it's non-compliant. But if in the crash it was stationary and got hit in the rear, then you can't really blame the electronic stability control for the outcome. Um, so this is really looking at what directly led to the outcome. So it does change things a bit. You can see vehicles, um, as in the case that I just described, um, a lot more of them then become compliant because uh, the actual whatever it, it was not in place for the vehicle didn't really contribute to the outcome so much. Road user stays about the same. You know, if you've got people traveling really, really fast above the speed limit, not wearing a, a seatbelt, quite often doesn't matter what else is in play. Um, if something goes wrong, you're going to get a fatal outcome. Um, and the road um, also was somewhat more compliant. Um, you can see there now there were actually eight fatal cases where uh when you look at what contributed to the actual fatal outcome um the non-compliance with the vehicle road users were a road none of them contributed so it sort of makes you wonder what what's what's going on with these crashes so examples here are one where a, a tree fell on the road and the person uh, smashed into the tree just not expecting it to be there obviously or collisions between light vehicles and heavy vehicles um or really old uh vehicle occupants who were quite frail and it didn't actually take that much for them to uh, uh, die after the crash. So that's, that's sort of, some, you can already start to see some of the gaps 
um, where we're going to need other kind of countermeasures if we're going to um, achieve a safe system in the future. And of course, uh, full non-compliance was then a bit, little bit less in this uh, analysis. Okay, conclusions. What does all this mean? Um, there are a few cases that were fully compliant, so we still have lots of gaps in the system to fill. That's probably not a surprise to anyone. Um, serious injuries and fatals are quite different. So if you just based your response to road trauma on fatal crashes, you'd probably do a lot on road users. Um, but when you look at serious injuries, um, you can see that um, uh, uh, non-compliant road users is, is less of a problem. Um, there's, the majority of them are actually you know, obeying all the relevant laws, etc. Um, so, so we need to bear that in mind and we can't just focus on road users in our road safety strategies. Um, uh, failure to wear seatbelts is, is particularly important in, in the fatal crashes. Um, a lot of the crashes involved loss of vehicular control. I think among the fatal crashes about 80% uh, of them were either single vehicle or head-on crashes where loss of control is really common. Um, so it makes uh, the case that electronic stability control is really vital and I think Stigson in, in her research said the same thing. Um, but also other technologies coming on board, all the lane departure type tech um, should also help with that as well. Um, very few of the crashes were on four or five star roads. Majority of them are one star, including highways, uh, particularly in rural areas. So obviously infrastructure improvements are important um, or lower speed limits um, so that the speed limit matches the infrastructure. And um, of course, if you're going to come to a CASA talk, someone at some stage is going to say lower speed limits and there it is, the first talk. Um, but also, of course, we know that we have to improve our infrastructure. It costs a lot of money to do so though. So it's very important to optimize the infrastructure spend and um, both Chris Stokes and Mario Monjardini are, are doing work with the department to try and work out how to optimize um, infrastructure expenditure. So that is very, very important work, I think. Um, and of course, in terms of infrastructure, protection of roadsides is very important for the loss of control crashes, which uh, make up a large proportion of the fatals. Uh, and overall, um, particularly moving forward, as we start to plug the gaps in the system, um, we will need uh, policymakers and experts in all jurisdictions um, to work together to try and uh, develop uh, new countermeasures across all of the pillars. So I think that wraps it up for me. Here is the uh, a journal article based on the works in um, traffic injury uh, prevention. Um, thank you very much for coming. Yeah, you do that. Yep. Um, Matt Mershaw is from REA and the Road Safety Team. Um, I've, I've read the, the report. It's really interesting. You know, it's really useful information. But I'm wondering if there's anything similar that can be done for vulnerable road users. Yeah, well, obviously vulnerable road users are, are more challenging, but I think it would probably be worthwhile doing a similar study looking looking at, at vulnerable road users. I mean, obviously um, some of the solutions you could have for, for light vehicles wouldn't apply, but I, I definitely think, you know, we, we need to provide a safe system for everybody and, and that includes them. So uh, a similar kind of, um, I haven't seen anything done like that um, using a, a model like this, but I totally think it should be done, so yeah. Yep. Sorry, look at the speed, like, uh, I mean, uh, like speed was a major factor in most of like, you know, fatal and serious, like the differential speed, like between the posted and the, at which they were driving, like, you know, I think that more in fatal compared to serious injuries. Yeah, I think, um, Exceeding the speed limit was more common in the fatal crashes. So, I mean, when, when you look at fatal crashes, you get high levels of every kind of aberrant behaviour. So, speeding is definitely uh, more important in the fatal crashes. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, Phil. As an extension of that, did you look at speeds below the speed um, Well, the model particularly specifies that um, uh, you have to be a. Um, conf uh, conforming, that's what I was looking for, conforming with the speed limit. So it was really done in, in terms of that model. So looking at people traveling below the limit, um, yeah, we didn't really look at that. Um, and, and that's often more difficult to determine. Um, and, and of course, in, in a lot of crashes, um, the struck vehicle will be a vehicle that's stationary or something. So um, when you're looking below this limit, it gets a little bit more complicated. Um, but yeah, the, certainly the model, what they're really focusing on is, is too much energy in the crash, which, which um, really means high speed is, is the big risk factor.
Okay, we might move on just so that we ready? can fit everything in. Thank you, Matt. No worries, thank you. That's fancy. Um, hi everyone, my name's Simon Reftry. I am a researcher at CASA. Um, I'm part of our Humans Factors group. I do a lot of I work in human behaviours areas. I have interests in um, vulnerable road users as well. So the project I'm talking about today was um, a project we did looking at what possible road safety benefits might be expected from placemaking activities. Um, and I did this work with my good friend Julia Ponte and Jeremy Woolley. Um, so what is placemaking? So basically placemaking is about making places that attract people to the area and encourage them to hang around and interact with the space and the people and the attractions and businesses that are there. Um, it involves a, a range of activities ranging from simple things like um, murals painted on the road, um, shared spaces, um, beautification things on footpaths and things like that, all the way through to uh, extreme cases um, where the road is completely, well not completely, but traffic's restricted and vehicle access is restricted and it's mostly a pedestrian um, area such as Rundle Mall. Um, so we looked at international um, studies to try and find the evidence, uh, mostly focusing on the UK, the US and New Zealand, um, jurisdictions with um, road um, areas and traffic patterns similar to Australia. Um, Placemaking is quite big in Europe, but the um, shopping areas are more centred around town square type situations and we have high streets with that are you know, main traffic routes and shopping areas at the same time, so quite different um, things to compare. So a couple of examples from the UK. Um, so this first one on the top left there is Kensington High Street, um, which they, that's after the um, placemaking took place. So they um, redid the, the footpath, winded and widened it in some places. Um, they removed um, pedestrian guards. Um, they added um, bike parking down the unused median strip and they improved um, pedestrian crossing areas. Um, so when they evaluated that, it had a slightly bigger reduction in crashes compared to other areas. Um, so crashes reduced by 44%, and I think it was the high, uh, low 40s <coughs> for the comparison areas. Um, but in that area there, the vehicle speeds were reduced. Um, there were a few crashes involving pedestrians, but not as many, and they were less severe, um, and there weren't any crashes associated with the bike parking. Um, the big one down the bottom is Sheaf Square in Sheffield, um, which they did to improve connections between the city centre and the railway station. Um, there's a big disused building there that they demolished. They put in a nice fountain and some other features. Um, and they found the, that um, they increased pedestrian movement in the area and reduced vehicle um, movements. They were reduced as well. And this last one is a, is a good example. We have the before and after picture. So this is New Road in Brighton. Um, you can see before it's clearly a road and afterwards it looks quite different. They've got a level surface so there's no um, raised footpath really. They've got dining on the street, pedestrians walking around the middle of the road. It looks a lot less like a road. Um, so their evaluation they found 162% increase in pedestrian activity. 93% reduction in traffic volume and there was a bit, uh, reduction in crashes in the four years um, period after it was installed but that was um, went from three to zero. So a lot of the places where they do placemaking um, like this are already um, low crash areas anyway so the, it's hard to measure the, the safety benefits just on standard um, measures of crashes. So uh, in the USA, so Broadway is a famous um, street in New York. Um, they had a lot of problems with that in terms of its alignment because it's a funny diagonal road that cuts across things and it led to um, difficult uh, intersection designs. There's a lot of crashes, um, horrible place for pedestrians to cross and walk around and things like that. So they did a, 
a range of activities. Um, uh, so they, you know, um, shorten pedestrian crossings. They introduced pedestrian plazas and and um, blocked off some legs of the intersection and re redesigned other intersections. Um, this is actually Times Square, and if you can see in the top left picture there, so that left lane is full of traffic. And this is the left lane now, full of pedestrians and people were having a good time. Um, so they did uh, an evaluation on that and they looked at um, mobility issues and things like that. So they found for vehicles, um, vehicles were diverted away a lot more and mobility wasn't really uh, impacted that much, improved um, in terms of vehicle flows and um, travel times. And also there's a big increase in pedestrian volumes uh, in the areas. Um, because of the redesigned intersections and everything else, um, injuries to motorists were reduced by 63%, um, which is pretty good, and injuries to pedestrians were decreased by about 35%. Um, and this is an example uh, of three different streets um, in New Zealand, and we've got before on the left and after on the right, and they've, they've did did similar things to the new road example where um, they've removed all the bollards and the traffic signs and the lines and the parking and pavers, put in trees and seats and much more nicer place for pedestrians to um, walk around and hang around. Um, no really major um, evaluation of crashes or things for this project. Um, they did notice reductions in traffic volumes um, an increase in pedestrian activity. Um, there were very few crashes before and after, so um, not really much of a change. Um, safety concerns they had associated with the new designs were um, parked vehicles, um, just because there's no clear parking space for vehicles, I think maybe they were stopping in weird spots. Um, vehicles also travelling the wrong way down, these are all one-way streets um, and shared zones, so vehicles travelling the wrong way were an issue. Um, and also there were increases in um, vehicle speeds when pedestrians weren't around. Um, but when pedestrians were around they noticed that the, um, vehicles were much slower, so with increased pedestrian density the vehicles went slower. Um, and now an example from South Australia. So the top left there is um, road murals painted on Rupina Street in Ingle Farm. Um, this was uh, um, done in partnership with the Department of Infrastructure and Transport. Um, and they consulted with the community about the design and where to put them. And then the community was involved in painting them um, and things like that. And they did an evaluation of those. And around um, a couple of the sites where the artworks were installed, they noticed they found reductions in 85th percentile speeds at two locations. One was about two and a half kilometres and the other one was a reduction in about one and a half kilometre kilometres. Um, and there was also um, reductions in vehicles travelling over the speed limit. And these these reductions stayed in place mostly um, over time for the follow-up evaluation as well. Um, these are just other examples. These um, were evaluated for safety-wise. This is a school near Kilkenny, I think, with the, and that's a, another street in High Massa. The name particularly eludes me, but just more examples of placemaking that's been happening in South Australia. Uh, and I will add that this report was done a couple of years ago, so there might be more recent um, works out and evaluations out that we just haven't had a chance to look at. Um, so conclusion wise, so it's difficult to evaluate the placemaking because no two um, activities are really the same, they all incorporate different elements. The sites that they are done in tend to differ a bit as well in, in vehicle volumes and characteristics and that sort of thing. So it's really difficult to judge which aspects of placemaking um, bring about the safety, um, but in terms of uh, what we found is more the traffic calming effects of um, the placemaking seem to be the big issue. So, um, you know, a result of reducing um, vehicle speeds and also reducing vehicle volume. So, cars going different ways to avoid having to travel through these places because um, they have to travel slower in shared zones and things like that. 
and areas where vehicles were restricted entirely um, also have good safety for pedestrians. Um, so inclusion placemaking does have the potential to improve safety of some areas, um, but you know we need to take care and make sure that um, it's safe for the pedestrians and people using these spaces with vehicles nearby. And I'm done. Thank you. <laughs> Anyone have any questions? Let's get the next one ready. I'll make an comment out of that study as well. Sure. One of the things we're interested in was just how much evidence was readily available or in the, the published publications domain. And it was uh, very difficult to come by any of it. Um, and taking South Australia as an example, I know there's lots of initiatives and things that, that have been attempted. Um, it's poorly documented and it, it is difficult to identify data that might relate to it. And I dare say, you know, our common concept of how we judge success with these things is missing the mark of the data we can obtain anyway. Like, you know, there's economic benefit to businesses along these places. Uh, there's a whole range of stimuli and, and different sort of proxy measures you can look at uh, to, to make the judgments on the success of these schemes as well. So that adds to the complexity. So moving forward, uh, if you're a practitioner involved in this area, I do suggest to give some consideration to documenting some of that things and of course on the evaluation side, um, you know, thinking about how you can make that more accessible so we can judge. Uh, because what I think we need to point towards is a meta-analysis of these sort of schemes ultimately across the nation. To, to get a good handle on what works when and what doesn't in a road safety sense. We have a question. Yeah, I just wanted to know, um, I know that you were saying that it's quite hard to work out which elements of place making have the most complex impact, but is that something you guys are planning to look into further? Um, it's something we could look at further if we had the funding and, the, and a project along those lines, so yeah. Because I'm just thinking from like, if I were a yeah, that was something we hoped to get from this project, but like I said, it's, like Jeremy said, there's not much evidence around, and the evidence that is there, they're all different for different reasons, and they don't single out the effects of individual elements, so it's hard to judge that specifically, but probably anything that slows traffic uh, or makes it want to go a different way or keeps it out altogether is the best option. I think a bigger sort of perspective on this is bigger picture, and Osroads is trying to move in this direction. Of it. There's a whole sort of movement in place paradigm as well, and where all those things fit in. So the, the best way I can describe it is this: you know, we're trending away from a, a linear road hierarchy more towards a, a balance between uh, place attributes and the need to move cars. And that broader picture isn't being, in, being embraced by things like Osroads, but the way forward is not crystal clear. Yes. Uh, just uh, just uh, an observation on, on the presentation. So you had that quite a quite a number of different projects. So your first half of it was about shared streets, which is uh, one treatment, and all of those projects try to create a place and bring more on street activity. Whereas the road murals, which proudly <coughs> I have painted and led on for mm -hmm. Pina Street and the others, right. so I know those projects really well. All they try to do is test out whether a yeah. bit of paint on the road will make a difference. We actually did four of those projects at the same time, you showed right. two. And so what we found that was quite interesting that they reduced the speed, as you have uh, pointed out, on three of them, but not on the fourth. So location and environmental conditions were very important. And where the road mural, mural didn't work was in the Adelaide Hills, right. where you had the depth of trees and yeah. uh, basically the topography of the road that prevented uh, the mural to be seen from a, from a long distance. Okay. And so I guess the, the uh, comment I would make is we need a lot more uh, evaluation, as Jeremy pointed out, mm. but what would be quite useful is to break down the projects by type, shared streets, uh, uh, road murals, and also extension of the footpaths and bringing more on-street dining yeah. and treat them as separate categories yeah. to see what impacts they bring about so that we can help councils make a decision what may work. Absolutely, yes. We might just, we have to move on. <laughs> We're already behind. Thank you. Um, but all these guys will be here at the end, so if you've got more questions, please come and talk to them. Next one is me. So, hello again. 
Um, I'm going to be talking about um, head and neck response to autonomous braking. Um, just some acknowledgements at the start. This was a collaboration between um, the, uh, us at CASA um, and some French researchers from the, I'm going to try and pronounce it, Institut de Biomechanique, Humain Georges Carpark uh, in Paris. Um, so in the middle we have uh, Baptiste uh, and his um, PhD student on the far left, Cedric there. Um, and they did um, have some assistance to travel over here through the um, French Australian Science Innovation Collaboration. Um, I also just want to make the point that I am no expert in biomechanics. That was not my part of the project. Um, but I'll try and explain to the best of my abilities. <laughs> um, so whiplash is a big issue um, in vehicle, le vehicle, vehicle collisions. Um, and it does result in a high cost to society. Um, I'm sure you probably know that even minor impacts can, can result in whiplash and that can have very long and expensive ongoing repercussions. Um, it's it's a, an injury me mechanism that's not well understood, um, but we know it's influenced by a few, a few key factors. Um, obviously the severity of the force, um, the initial alignment of the neck, um, uh, things like the physical strength of the person and their size. Um, Awareness is a big factor as well, so if you know that an impact is coming, um, and then that's obviously related to muscle activation in trying to resist that, that force. Um, a lot of the research that goes into whiplash um, is conducted with dummies that are set up in a specific position, so this is what we call in position. So facing forwards, seated correctly, um, and then an impact goes forward and back. Um, Autonomous vehicles are coming, and I'm not just talking about the far future here, despite these images. Um, a lot of you are probably driving a car that can quite aggressively hit the brakes if it thinks you're going to crash. Um, these systems, you know, might encourage you to be, and I'm talking about um, other vehicle occupants as well here. So, you know, you might be looking down reading um, when this vehicle just suddenly jams on the brakes itself. Um, the car doesn't know that you, what position you're in, it just hits the brakes as hard as it can to stop a collision from happening. Um, and so the question is, does autonomous braking um, pose a greater threat or severity of whiplash? Um, just to give you some more visceral examples of what I mean by in position and out of position. Oh, I can't see the mouse there. Is that going to play? No. Let me, I might just have to break out, um, show you on here. So this is an in position, this person, it's a frontal collision, he knows it's coming and he's got his, you know, activating his neck, um, out of position, coming from a strange angle, not aware that it's coming and you can obviously see the impacts of that. Um, So the study then was to explore the differences in head dynamic motion between human um, emergency braking and autonomous emergency braking for three scenarios where one's in position and two that are out of position. Um, we couldn't find any reports of this being done before, so this is, we believe, the first time that this has been explored um, and we also acknowledge that that obviously means that we're going into sort of uncharted territory and, and, and we might be making some mistakes in how we're studying it. but. Um, this is our attempt. So the experimental setup here, um, we have a vehicle um, that was equipped with an autonomous emergency braking system. Um, we then fitted that with um, some pedal robots that you can see here, so activating the accelerator and brake pedal. Um, the autonomous emergency braking is preceded by some warning noises, so it beeps, and you'll see some examples of that, so it lets you know that it's about to brake. Um, the pedal robots here were used um, because we didn't want to injure the subjects. We're using very low speeds. Your cruise control doesn't work at eight kilometers an hour and 15 kilometers an hour. So we had to use these, these robots to achieve those speeds. Um, and we have the brake pedal robot that is reproducing this human braking. So we determined what a human does when they hit the brakes in an emergency and we replicated that so we can do it over and over in a repeatable way. Um, what else do I need to tell you? Uh, the volunteer subjects, which again I'll give you a bit more information, were fitted with um, some IMUs. So these are little sensors that can measure the acceleration on different parts of the body. So they had a sensor on the top of their head, one at the base of their neck, and one at the base of their spine, just above their bum. Um, 
the vehicle had researchers on board. One was in the driver's seat to control the vehicle um, or steer. They don't need to use the pedals. <laughs> um, there was a person in the back controlling the pedal robots and there was another person in the back um, sort of in charge of the, the test um, and telling the, um, the subjects how to position themselves prior to each test occurring. The test subjects were seated in the left-hand seat front passenger position. So there were 12 conditions that we tested. Uh, so three body positions, you can see those here. The forward, this is in position, so just facing forward. And then two out of position discussion is turning their head to the right as if they were talking to the driver and another one looking down as if they were reading a book or looking at their phone. We did two vehicle speeds um, and the two braking modes. Each of these were, was repeated three times per subject. Um, so three times 12 is 36 braking sequences. Um, we did have an ethics approval for this, and this was all very low speed, so just to <laughs> reassure you. Uh, there were 10 volunteer subjects. They were recruited um, through the university. Um, just coincidentally, they all ended up being male. Um, you could see their height, weight, and age there. Uh, the conditions were no previous whiplash or head injury, uh, not involved in a collision for the last five years, no current neck stiffness, um, and not under the influence of alcohol or drugs. Um, we did follow up with all the subjects two weeks later and none of them reported any kind of neck stiffness, so that's good news. Uh, just to give you an example of what a braking sequence looks like, so this is the Torrens Parade Ground, if you don't recognise it. Um, we'd start at the start of the track, uh, we'd instruct the, the subject how to position themselves, so which one of those three positions. We would take off, the pedal robot would achieve the test speed that we're trying to hit, um, and then we would either do an autonomous brake, which is what you see here. So we used a, a, a dummy there to trigger the autonomous braking. Or at some point between there and there, the pedal robot would apply the brake. So the test subject does not know what's going to happen. Obviously, they can see when they get to this point that that's, but it's beeping a little bit earlier than that point anyway. So they get to, get to hear what's happening. Uh, just to show you what it looks like in the car, this is not going to work again. So I'll have to brake out. work. All very low speed but um, enough to give us what we need. So uh, some results, these are the, the some graphs of the acceleration of the car during the different braking modes, so slow, slower speed and, and the faster speed. Um, takeaways from this are that the autonomous emergency braking is harder than the human braking. So this blue line here is, goes down at a, at a greater slope. Um, that brings the vehicle to a stop faster. Um, and this is, has been known for many, many years that humans don't hit the brakes as hard as they should in most situations. Um, and the autonomous emergency braking does wait until the last second. So it is having to hit the brakes harder. Um, the other little thing to note is the AEB does a little sort of light braking at the beginning. You can see it more pronounced on this 15k one. So it brakes a little bit and then it hits the brakes really, really hard. Um, the other thing to note here is that, that we had really good consistency, which is what we wanted, that we're not getting braking all over the place during, so it was very repeatable. Um, Head acceleration, just to give you an example of what happens. So here you can see the vehicle deceleration in the red. Um, the S1, the green line here, is the sensor on their, the, just above their bum on their spine. That tracks well with the vehicle. So you can imagine the seat, you know, your body goes with the car as it's decelerating. T1 is the top of your neck. So as you're decelerating, um, your body pitches forward. And then finally, a little bit later, your head then pitches forward. So you, you, you know, you're like a pendulum as you go forward. Um, we compared the head acceleration to the vehicle acceleration and found that uh, this was higher during human braking compared to the AEB, which was an interesting result given the AEB was, was harder braking. Um, and we'll, we'll explore why that is a little bit later. Um, the initial position and the speed of the vehicle did not seem to affect the amount of head acceleration compared to the um, vehicle. We also looked at head angle motion. So this is the angle between the top of your, or the base of your neck and the top of your head. So this much, um, you know, we're showing the results from 
all the different subjects here in the grey lines, but we've just picked out a single subject here with the colours. Um, and you can see that um, in the forward position, had the minimum amount of, of head motion across the, the tests. Um, the discussion position was a little bit higher and the phone was, was the greatest. Um, the head angle motion uh, was not affected by the type of braking or um, the speed. So that was also interesting. Um, yeah, I think we'll go to interpretation. So, you know, this is all very initial. Like I say, this is the first time I think anyone's done this, explored it. Um, this is sort of our interpretation of what we've got out of this. I would also say there's lots more results in, in, in the paper we've done that I'll give a reference to. But I just thought I'd give you a little tidbits here. Um, the, we believe that the warning sound prior to the AEB helps the, the subjects you know, engage their neck muscles and that's why we see less acceleration in, that, in those AEB um, braking events um, despite it being harsher braking. Um, the restricted view of the track, obviously when they're sort of looking down at the phone or talking to the driver, limits their sort of knowledge of when these things are going to occur, so that's why we get more head motion during those events. Um, and in those positions your neck and muscles are in, are in a stretched position already, so you have less ability to resist head motion. Um, we think it's probably important that um, this is taken to, into account um, into the future with manufacturers producing these types of vehicles. Um, we can sort of envisage a system that might be able to detect the pose of a vehicle if we're looking far future now to sort of fully autonomous vehicles. If we know where, where people are looking or, or, or their positions, we might be able to um, adapt that braking sequence to be not as harsh if we know that they're in a vulnerable position. or um, apply those auditory or even a visual warning to bring their head up to a, a position that's more favourable, um, knowing that there's going to be some really harsh braking about to occur. Um, so that's something to explore for the future. Thank you. And there's a reference. Okay, maybe one or two questions? Yeah? With the audible alert from the AEB system, if you've got the radio on and it drowns it out, does that mean they wouldn't hear it? And does that mean that you should have the AEB alert go over the radio sound, like muted? Uh, I'm not sure what would happen if you had the radio on. It may, possibly it does um, mute the radio or go over the top of the radio, but yes, I guess that's a good point. That it's important to be able to hear the warnings. Yeah. Okay, excellent. We'll move on to the next one. Thank you. Thanks, Jamie. No worries. All right, so thanks for coming, everyone. My name is Martin Ellsgood, and I'll be talking to you about um, our CASA EDR database. Um, basically, this short presentation that I'll be doing is an introduction to Sam's next one, and it kind of shows you where his data comes from. So, um, what is an EDR? An EDR is uh, basically a black box that's in um, road vehicles. Um, it stands for Event Data Recorder, and the event is basically where it, it's when a crash happens. So it's essentially a crash data recorder. Um, modern vehicles these days have um, airbag control modules, and uh, we can do a download from those modules to see what the car was doing before the crash and shortly after the crash. Um, so let's look at a case study um, for the EDR in practice. Uh, this is a crash that uh, I think Sam and I went to um, a few months ago and uh, this is footage from that crash. So there's a white sedan in the top left corner in the red circle um, and that comes to a quick stop at the traffic lights and then is uh, rear-ended by another car and we downloaded from this white car, so pay attention to that one. It's a crash, and I'll just play it again just in case anyone missed it. And we all love crash videos as well. 
So um, an EDR download contains both um, pre-impact data and post-impact data. Um, firstly, looking at the pre-impact data, we can see a um, we can download a, essentially a table that comes out with lots of data about um, the travel speed, the pedal positions, uh, steering inputs, and yeah, a couple of other things just before the crash happened. Um, so each time step, each um, column is uh, there's about there's usually 0.5 seconds between each one, and it kind of works like this. Um, hopefully this works. So it's like 0.5 seconds for each step and we can look back in time to see what was, what the car was doing. And then crash. Um, so then if we look just at the EDR table, we can see vehicle speed, which is um, in the square brackets there, not sure if that's readable, but 75 k's per hour at the first time step and then down to three kilometers per hour. Uh, accelerator pedal position for this white car it was obviously braking, so um, it just came to a stop, but there was no acceleration from this car. Uh, and then we can look at the brake pressure and whether or not the actual pedal was on or off and how hard they were braking as well. And then we can also see the steering input from this driver which is pretty much is just, just going straight ahead, obviously. Um, Post-impact, we can look at um, the crash pulse of the vehicle's delta V, which is um, change in velocity. And this is recorded at a much higher frequency than um, like seconds. Like, so this is only 0.1 seconds of the crash, and we can uh, see that the vehicle increased about 18 kilometers per hour from the impact. Um, delta V is commonly used to correlate uh, and predict injury severities of occupants. So our collection at CASA has been going on since 2017 and uh, we, we get them from a crashed vehicle auction yard um, called Pickles out north and we also receive some from SAPOL's major crash unit. So these crashes are matched to police reports, hospital injury records, and driver offence history. And over the last few years, we've collected about over 650 crashes. Um, so yeah, looking at the representativeness of that uh, sample, uh, we, we've noticed that our, our cases are kind of skewed towards the more hospital um, yeah, a higher level than hospital treated um, because we, we think that the EDRs, they actually have a certain threshold for when a crash happens. Um, so we, we miss out on a lot of the non-injury cases, which are like minor fender benders when the car doesn't really move that much after a crash. So it doesn't quite record those ones. Um, and then if we look at um, the speed zones in comparison to um, South Australia's passenger vehicle crashes, um, and it's Pretty, pretty well matches all of those um, variables. Uh, and we can look at a few different variables and the sample actually quite, yeah, it gets really close to matching it really well. Uh, some of our EDR studies uh, include um, looking at the pre-impact actions that drivers make just before a crash happens. Uh, we've looked at uh, injury, the, the correlation between injury risk and delta V and we've, we've done a lot of research into the, the speeding in crashes and uh, what type of drivers are speeding, what cars are involved in speeding and where those um, speeding crashes happen. Um, and then we've also looked at um, intelligent speed assist, so where somebody is essentially limited to the speed limit of the road and what benefit that could actually have on reducing uh, the amount of crashes there. So this is all based on our EDR database and I think that's it. So next um, presentation will be by Sam and it will use some of this information.
Yeah, thanks for that uh, introduction to my talk. Um, yeah, EDR data is something that's incredibly valuable. I started my career at CASA um, doing a lot of crash reconstructions and trying to painstakingly uh, reconstruct crashes to work out what uh, speed people were doing. And EDR really just gives us um, kind of a shortcut to that. Um, so what I'm going to be talking about is one of those uh, applications of all this data. Uh, and that's the contribution of various levels of speeding to fatal and serious road trauma, uh, which is some work I did with uh, Martin and uh, Giulio Ponti as well. So the main question here was, uh, if you eliminate speeding, how much will this reduce fatal and serious crashes? Or in other words, what contribution is speeding making to fatal and serious crashes? Because it doesn't just naturally follow that if uh, you got rid of speeding, say 30% of, to pluck a number out of the air, of people were speeding, it doesn't naturally follow that if you get rid of those, then we're going to reduce fatal serious injury crashes by 30%. It depends how much they were speeding by, how much is coming down, what that effect that has on the crash. Um, and EDR data allows us to have a, a quite a deep look at that. Uh, and also we're interested in how much does each level of speeding um, contribute to overall reduction in fatal and serious injuries because um, on the one hand often there's a lot of talk about you know the extreme speeders, the people that are doing really really high level speeding. Uh, on the other hand we also um, have had a focus in this state in the past on creeping and low level speeding um, and so we just wanted to look at their relative contributions. So um, we could only use about half the data in our database because we needed to uh, just have the bullet vehicles. Uh, the vehicles are actually uh, doing the striking. Uh, so we had 283 bullet vehicles, and that's our crash data uh, that we have here. Uh, and then we need to calculate the impact speeds without speeding. And so we, to do that, we use a change in impact speed model, which I'll run through in a moment. Uh, and then from that, we need to work out what is the reduction in the probability of a fatal and serious injury from that change in speed. And so we used um, uh, some new injury risk curves that we've developed recently. Uh, for that purpose and then through this process we can look at the contribution of speeding to fatal and serious injuries. So just to give uh, an example of how we would do this for a case, uh, so this is the EDR data uh, from a vehicle involved in a rear end crash in a 60 km an hour zone so you can see there that uh, 2.1 seconds before the crash it was actually going 66 not 60. Um, and it slowed to 40 kilometers an hour um, at impact. So that's actually a fairly um, typical uh, kind of crash, I suppose, our rear end crashes. So we put that into our change in impact speed model, uh, which don't worry too much about <laughs> the specifics of the equation. But uh, the main thing I wanted to point out here is that um, the EDR data allows us to have very specific inputs into the, so not only do we have a very accurate original travel speed and impact speed, we can also work out the time uh, when they started to break uh, within um, you know, a fairly uh, small um, increment of time. Um, and we also have the, kind of the average level that they're breaking and we can apply all these things uh, into our model. So in our case where we had someone going 66, uh, we also assume a reaction time um, and it's going to take them 27.5 metres to react. The person who would be going the speed limit, going 60, uh, sa has already saved two and a half metres. So they've got a bit of extra space to break and they're braking from a lower speed, which is our kind of when they start braking is our, our B point there, B1 or B2, not the bananas. Um, and then uh, we can see the impact speeds there. The original speed, impact speed was 40, and if the person was going 60, it would be only 22. So even with just a six kilometer an hour reduction, we're getting an 18 kilometer an hour reduction in impact speed, which makes a, a reasonable difference. So we apply these uh, risk curves. So these are uh, risk curves that um, uh, myself and my colleagues uh, have developed recently, actually developed with EDR data, but uh, a much larger database from the US. Um, and we can look at the, uh, the risk of fatal or serious injury. Now, we're not talking big uh, probabilities of fatal or serious injury because it's only a rear end crash, but imagine this for, um, you know, like a 100 km an hour side impact or things like this, um, these would be much higher. But still, the proportion 
uh, reduction in risk is quite large. Even if with just this uh, six kilometer hour reduction, we're getting a 68 cent reduction in serious injury risk. So to look at our results overall, um, one of the other in interesting things about the EDR data is it just gives us a really good sense of uh, how many people are speeding in crashes and at what uh, level they are doing so. Um, so I hope you can see that. So this is the, um, of the people that were speeding, uh, how much were they speeding by? And we can see most, the, the largest proportion are in that, just that kind of creeping level, one to five kilometres an hour over the speed limit. And that kind of reduces, but we do also, uh, because we've grouped everything over 45, um, and above over the speed limit, uh, we're getting a reasonable percentage there as well, which is, of course, uh, quite concerning. When we then apply our model and look at uh, which of these um, bands are contributing uh, to fatal and serious injuries, we can see overall, if we eliminated speeding, we could reduce fatal and serious injuries by 18%. Um, but that's quite distributed across all these speeding bands. Yes, as we might expect, the really high level speeding does contribute a reasonable amount of this, but it's still not that much compared to the total. It's you know, a little bit over 4.5%. And interestingly, because we have so many people creeping over the speed limit, that is actually the, the next biggest band, is that very low level speeding. If we Look at this just in 10 kilometer hour increments or um, 15 for the lower ones, just to kind of group it a little bit more, smooth it out. Uh, we can see that we're getting about a, a quarter of the uh, contribution from low level speeding, one to 10 kilometers an hour over. And that's actually very similar to that 45 uh, and over. We're getting a little bit more for 31 to 45. That's just because with the awkwardness of the numbers, we had to group, uh, it's a slightly larger group. It's 15, a 15 kilometer hour band there. So from this, uh, we concluded that um, low level speeding is not benign. It's sometimes assumed uh, it is, um, but it certainly is not. This further reinforces that. But also we think that this really means intervention should focus on all levels of speeding. It shouldn't just be one or the other. Um, it should be across the board. Um, just a few limitations to note. Um, a sample does not contain many vulnerable road users. Uh, we did have a, a, a couple of pedestrian crashes in there. The EDRs are not necessarily going to register pedestrian crashes in all cases. Um, we, we can't download from motorcycles, unfortunately, so we don't have those. So uh, that's just a bit of a caveat there. The other thing is that um, we're really just looking at change in impact speed. But as you change the kind of the speed of the vehicle, the the nature of the collision, the impact configuration could change. And this could have an effect. It could go both ways. Uh, it could uh, start from the, be at the front of the vehicle, be more towards the centre, uh, which is a worse impact. This is in a side impact uh, where this is particularly going to be the case. But of course, if we saw that vehicle down, it might be uh, towards the rear of the vehicle, which is a, a much less severe impact, or indeed that vehicle could clear. Uh, we didn't take that into account. We think on balance that probably makes our results uh, conservative. So uh, just some acknowledgements. Um, really want to acknowledge the funders of this particular analysis was the Transport Accident Commission. Um, and uh, yeah, very grateful for their, their funding. Um, that, and uh, also the data collection of all the EDR data uh, that we do uh, is funded by both them and the Department of Infrastructure and Transport here. Um, also very grateful for the assistance uh, of um, the salvage uh, team at Pickles uh, and also the South Australian Police who uh, supply us with uh, the vehicle collision reports or shield reports as they're called now, uh, which is through Christine Basso and David Kuchemais and Mark Fulcher who um, who provide us with uh, EDRs from fatal uh, cases. So yeah, thank you for your time. Uh, any questions for Sam? Yes. Um, the model that we've worked on the difference in speed, mm. was there any discernible difference to the bottom of the speed overall, like did the speeding matter more in a 100k crash than a 60k crash? Didn't, didn't look at that specifically, no. Yes? Um, did any of your research look at autonomous 
emergency braking, whether the vehicles, um, whether, but you could see how, how much the brake was applied. Did any of that factor in whether that kind of, um, whether the vehicles had it or whether it was used? Yeah, we, we didn't look at that specifically for this. We have um, look, looked at that uh, in the past and, and how much autonomous emergency braking would improve upon human performance, um, and it is, it is quite a bit. Um, but that's certainly something that uh, EDR data would lend itself to have, because it provides that kind of um, all those pre-impact speeds and the level that the human was braking at. Um, but yeah, I think um, there wouldn't be a whole lot in our sample that had autonomous emergency braking yet, because crash vehicles tend to be a little bit of an older sample. Um, but we, we certainly ha are getting some, um, yeah. So that would be something interesting for the future, I think. Uh, I'm yeah. conscious that it is yeah. still a talk, so if anyone <laughs> does leave, thanks for coming. Um, we've just got one more, so we'll squeeze it in. Hey, Gun, I'm Julio from Kaza. Um, I might sp speed up this one. I won't go through the big um, spiel I was going to go through. But basically, this was a project looking at the prevalence of in-vehicle drive distraction in moving traffic. And basically, I've done this presentation before, but um, we recently submitted it and was accepted for publication in transport research. Um, and the value add from the reviewers made us re-look at some of the stuff that we did. So I'm just going to present some of those extra results and I'd like to acknowledge um, Sally Edwards and Lisa Wondersitz for their assistance. So first of all, um, what is distracted driving? I'm sure you all know what it is. I won't spend too much time on it, um, but it's basically, yeah, any diversion from a driver's attention from the essential task of driving a vehicle in favour of other ones. And um, previous studies, like the naturalistic studies um, that looked at um, drive distractions, I found that 37% um, for, say, self-grooming, and you can see the other ones, and that basically 2% were interactions with technology, including um, mobile phones. So if you look at previous Australian studies um, who looked at um, observational studies, they looked at slowing or stationary vehicles, and they found that um, you know, there was 3.4% handheld phone use, 1.4% percent hands-free phone use and um, looking at the South Australian study um, Lisa found in 2014 that 0.6% um, of drivers uh, were using a handheld phone. Um, and as you know um, we acknowledge that driving with a BSC of 0.05 doubles your risk of casualty crash and driving 5Ks and over the um, speed limit of 60K doubles your risk of crash but if you look at studies from, say, Dingus, who did naturalistic studies, they found that um, touching an in, in vehicle device increases risk by almost five times, and reaching or reading increases crash risk by nine times. Um, so it puts it in you know, perspective when you consider um, other risks you know, for speeding and alcohol use. Oops. So um, looking in uh, distraction, driver distraction and crashes, you can see Beanland and also one sits um, from South Australia found that 13.8% to 16% of crashes involve some sort of distraction. And distraction from mobile phone use specifically was 0.9% to 2.5% of crashes. Um, so basically our, the study of our, um, our well, the point of our study was to see if we could use elevated cameras or specialised cameras to look inside vehicles as they were moving in traffic as opposed to vehicles that were stationary at traffic lights to see if we could capture any distracted driving behaviours. And, um, and previous studies have mainly looked at passenger vehicles, they don't look at heavy vehicles. So in this study we also looked at heavy vehicles as well as passenger vehicles and we could do this um, from an elevated position. And we also looked at different speed limits, uh, 50k, 60k and 100k speed limit zones. So the process was uh, as written here. We did four locations, um, all on elevated sites. Oh, sorry, <laughs> I'm looking at the wrong thing. Um, four locations, um, you can see them here. Um, and you probably recognise the roads. There's um, Waverley Ridge Road, looking at Southeastern Freeway. Um, and I won't spend too much time on that. And that's what it looked like when we set up the cameras. So you can see there's one there, one there, and one there, capturing above, uh, beyond, and from the side. And this is the sort of picture, pixelated, so you don't see the driver. And we you know, zoomed in, and you can see, for example, this person's got two distractions on his windscreen, as well as a cigarette in his hand. So basically we looked at all the, we had basically did um, two hours at each location then selected a half an hour period from each of those locations that looked at all the distractions that um, drivers might have been engaged in. 
So, um, yeah, I'll keep going. So this is the results. So you can see the mobile phone. I'll read this out. This makes it more sense. There were a total of 920 unique drivers um, across the four sites and 8.9% or 82 were engaged in behaviours that met the definition of distracted driving. Uh, the five types of mobile phone use accounted for 2.5% of distracted driving. However, the single most distracted behaviour was searching for or holding an object, and that was 1.8%. Notably, eating or drinking was also quite prevalent at 1.5%. Uh, so that's a summary. Um, just interestingly that, um, as mentioned, the most frequent observed engaged, um, distracted driving behaviour was mobile phone use, with 23 drivers, or 2.5%, undertaking one of the five mobile phone behaviours listed. Um, and 18 of the 23 drivers, or 2% of all drivers, were actually involved in illegal mobile phone use, as defined by the Australian Road Rules. And um, in 17 of these observations, the illegal phone use would have been concealed to human roadside observation. So people looking on the side of the road probably wouldn't have seen it because they um, basically hid the phone um, in their lap or on their leg or under the window sill or steering wheel. So, and also most drivers were uh, male, but we didn't, couldn't account, or didn't account for a, um, exposure, so didn't look at all the genders of all the drivers, not distracted. So here are some, just ex some examples. You can see this person, mobile phone, obviously in their hand, and, and kind of like hiding it. And you can see example of eating, drinking, and smoking, which are also common behaviours. Um, here's another photo of a very um, distracted <laughs> heavy vehicle driver. And um, yeah, I, I don't know if he could have any more distractions. <laughs> and if you look at um, distraction by speed limit, um, there was actually a statistically significant um, difference between 50 k's an hour and 60 k's an hour, and between 50 and 100 k's an hour, and the difference um, between 60 and 100 was approaching statistically statistical significance. So people are more likely to use their phone at low speeds compared to high speeds roads. Um, and so looking at one of the interesting things we thought, saw was that most observations are done of passenger vehicles. So we looked at um, heavy vehicles and passenger vehicles and we found that the majority of observations were obviously in passenger vehicles and the distra distraction rate um, was 8.6% for dis um, drivers compared to 14% distraction rate for heavy vehicle drivers. Only one heavy vehicle driver, however, was observed using a mobile phone. So the distractions are smoking, eating, drinking. And heavy vehicles were so 1.6 times more likely to be driving distracted compared to passenger vehicle drivers, but this was not statistically significant. Um, so the current study is the first we're aware of to deploy elevated covert video technology that was capable of clearly recording behaviours of drivers inside moving passenger vehicles and heavy vehicles, and in succession um, while using a public road network at a self-selected free speed. Um, it also found that 2% of drivers used their mobile phone illegally while moving in traffic and did so in a concealed manner, um, which is likely to be a deliberate attempt to evade police detection or avoid social scrutiny. And so the methods of mobile phone enforcement in Australia using covert cameras, as have been undertaken in New South Wales, appears to be the optimal method for capturing illegal distracted behaviour and the pre-enforcement data um, we've seen from them is similar to our results. Um, however, the other distracted behaviours were also, was also prevalent in our study, so targeting mobile phone use alone won't sufficiently address distracted driving. Um, this study also found that distractions decreased as the speed limit increased, um, suggesting that drivers consciously self-regulate and moderate their driving behaviours and may engage in um, behaviours to lessen their risk of having a crash. So they're more likely to do it in low-speed environments rather than high-speed environments, um, or in low-speed environments they're more likely to start the mobile phone or their distracted behaviour and continue it. And it's worthy of um, more investigation. Importantly, the study found that um, the observations of distractions and moving traffic needs to examine heavy vehicles. Um, we found that heavy vehicles um, only comprised 5.4% of traffic, but they were 1.6 times more likely to be distracted uh, compared to passenger vehicle drivers. And this is concerning given the aggressivity of heavy vehicles and research by Bud and others from Monash found there's more than a double risk of injury to those passengers and um, those people in passenger vehicles when involved in a crash with a heavy vehicle compared to a crash with another passenger vehicle. Um, this study also demonstrated that there's innovative specialised technology capable of covertly recording distracted driving in moving traffic on public roads and jurisdictions all over the world could use such a methodology to, um, to periodically monitor prevalence of distracted driving behaviours consistently over time or as a means to evaluate interventions aimed at changing distracted behaving to um, behaviour, such as the ones that um, SAPOL and, and DIT are using. Um, and 
yeah, so behavioural interventions aren't, and enforcement aren't likely to um, affect all drivers, so people still use their mobile phones even though there's you know, adverts saying don't do it or it's illegal. Um, so we sort of have to consider a safe systems approach which you know, means you know, adopting technologies that have lane keep assist or AEB so that if someone is distracted, like we had a case last night, a crash we went to, someone um, was looking at their radio and before they knew it there was a car in front of them and they rear-ended that car. If they had AEB they probably would have stopped and not had the collision at all. And systems like lane keep assist stop people from um, moving from out of their lane if they're distracted as well as um, guardrails and safety wire ropes to stop people hitting roadside to have objects if they're distracted. And I think that's it and thank you to um, the guys from One Task for assisting us and for the ongoing support from DIT. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Worried about that lady that was looking down. She might have had her neck. <laughs> <laughs> I think she did. Uh, just a quick question. Do you know if in South Australia uh, they've tried enforcing distracted driving or not as yet? Not general distracted driving, I don't think. I think there are rules that say that if you're not in um, proper control of your vehicle, so if you're you know, having a coffee and you look like you're driving all over the road, the police can pull you over and fine you for not having control of your vehicle. But I don't think they generally pull people over for having a cup of coffee. I was just um, absolutely blown away that you can install the Jumbo Bridge and actually get that level of data. Yeah, well that's... Yeah, the new cameras that are being used in New South Wales and that are, I think are going to be trialled in South Australia, they can do that as well. And not only that, but they can capture the speeds of the vehicles, which is what we're hoping that the data that we can access I believe so. That's other groups are uh, doing that sort of research. There's, you know, all these the beeps from false alarms from AEB. Um, you know, all the navigation systems they've got and all the warnings. They're all distractions. I mean. And we find a lot of people turn off, that's one of the other studies we want to do is looking at if something's so distracting that people turn it off, like lane departure warning, I don't know if you've got a car with it, and you turn around the corner, you're not even departing the lane and it goes off and people just turn it off. So yeah, the modern vehicles do have a lot of distracting features. There's one alcohol heat lock, also the same kind of where it detects, you know, someone, if someone is already drunk like you, it doesn't get the car start or reach the start. Mm. Okay, thank you guys. I think we'll, we'll pack it up because it is quite late. But thank you to the presenters and thank you for coming along. Um, please keep in mind the conference coming up uh, at that scholarship. Um, and I will hopefully send you the video in a little while. And please spread that around. Um, and we'll see you at the, the next seminar. Thank you. Thanks.